of my life. But the grandma I knew was a quiet Jewish grandma from Flushing, New York. Um, dinners were matzo ball soup, cantaloupe or melon on the table, chicken, mandel bread or arugula for dessert, and then a game of rummy cub, or as she would call it, stones. I always knew growing up, there was more to my quiet grandma. She would share little tidbits of her journey in life and her survival from the Holocaust. When I visited my grandma for the last time in her, of her journey in her life and her survival, sorry, when I visited my grandma for the last time in June 2013 in New York, she was 97 years old. She would keep her eyes closed then most of the time. I leaned in and kissed my grandma and told her I had to head back to Chicago. And she opened her eyes wide, looked me right in my eyes, squeezed my hand and signaled that this would be her last journey. She would pass away that July, 2013. It made me realize that it was time to pass on her and my grandfather's journey. I tell their story not only as a personal journey, but the goal of this presentation is to inspire others to trace their roots, young and old. It can be done. So I am humbled to take you on this journey with me. That's a picture of me and my grandma uh, when I was a little boy in Staten Island, New York. And you're gonna get to learn about my grandma and all these last names and my grandpa, but I put it in the title because her journey is so fascinating. She had so many journeys in life. So how did our journey start? Well, my family journey started like many in the 19, uh, in late 1990s and early um, 2000s and beyond uh, when we became interested in tracing our family uh, roots. And, and what, what happened was in about the early 2000s, things started opening up in Eastern Europe uh, for people to go back and get records and trace routes. And, and I picked this um, and I'm not going to read it, but I picked this little um, excerpt from an article about what was going on in the late 1990s and 2000s and how people were struggling to find their records, but it was open and available. Um, and people started doing it, especially my dad's generation started become, became interested. Um, and that's exactly what we did. This is a picture of my dad, my brother and me. Um, and for my dad's 60th birthday in 2006, we will go back to where my grandmother is uh, from and what you'll learn um, in Lithuania um, and retrace our family route, uh, routes. And why my family was so lucky and why I encourage others to do it is it was just amazing how much record there really is out there. So my dad, Steve, uh, and you'll come to learn his real name is Sioma, uh, becomes interested in tracing our routes. Um, we were lucky. My grandmother was alive for so long, and we have her personal memories before we leave. Um, we do uh, internet and genealogy research to learn more. We're able to reconnect with family members that we find through research, and then our very um, awesome trip back to the homeland. Uh, so my family journey um, starts in, um, in Lithuania, and it's really fascinating. Um, we'll start in Lithuania. My family before the war will go to Cuba, and, and I'll get into that a, a little later. My grandmother, uh, not the lucky one of the family, will return to Lithuania with my great grandparents while the rest of her family will stay, live in Cuba. My grandmother will survive the Holocaust and the family in Cuba learn of her survival and bring her back uh, to Cuba. And then eventually we will come uh, to New York um, and the United States. So quick, I mean, I'll go through this quick because my family story is uh, much more interesting than history, but for people that want to know, I don't think a lot of people know about Lithuania and the Latvian countries and what happened during the war. But basically, Lithuania uh, was a democratic state um, from February 1918 until World War II. It'll get ping-ponged between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union for quite some time. Um, Nazis um, invade and occupy Lithuania during World War II. The so it'll become part of the Soviet Union after World War II, and it was a long struggle for Lithuania to become sovereign um, in 1990 to 1991. But the Jewish life in Lithuania, you can see a photo here. Uh, it was very Jewish, um, and it was thriving for World War II. Just to give you some stats, 
The Jewish population was about 210 to 250,000 uh, before the war. Vilnius, a very famous city in Lithuania, was considered the Jerusalem of the North. Um, you could just get a flavor for it, not only in the photo, but 45% of the city population uh, was Jewish. There were 110 synagogues in Vilnius alone uh, and 10 yeshivas. Uh, the famed Yiddish Institute of Higher Learning was in Vilnius. Um, and let's now flash to my family. Um, here's a map of Lithuania. So you get a feel for where we are in Lithuania and we'll go during uh, before the Nazis uh, invade. My grandfather's side of the family, the Jerichimowitz side is from Belarus, that's where our last name will originate from, a uh, son of Yerokim. Um, my grandmother's family uh, is from Birze, uh, up on the upper right-hand side of Lithuania. Um, I boxed two other very important cities. My grandfather um, will ultimately uh, come from and live in uh, Kaunas. Uh, my grandmother is studying in Vilnius um, to become a nurse uh, when the Nazis invade Lithuania. So this is sort of where we are in Lithuania. Thanks to some research in Lithuania and why I encourage many uh, to take on this task, because uh, it's so important to pass on our stories. Uh, the Lithuanian State Historical Archives, when we went to Lithuania in 2006, helped us put together a family tree. You can see from the family tree, we date back to the early 1800s um, in Lithuania uh, from the Shokin family in Birze. Uh, this is my... Um, great grandparents um, tree. Um, you'll see where the arrows are. Uh, Feig Rochel on the left is my great grandmother. Uh, Eba Adul is my great grandfather. Uh, they will get married and have grandma Leah uh, with many other siblings. On the right hand, you'll see the chart of the surviving siblings. Uh, there are other children that didn't make it out of childbirth or died young. But these are the family members, the oldest being Tilly, uh, who was born in 1895. My grandmother, Leah, is the youngest um, of this group, um, born in 1915. So you can see the span of the brothers. Bertha will become the most critical person in the story, but these are my grandmother's siblings. They will all go to Cuba, uh, where my family um, resides. So here are my many um, journeys of my grandmother. My grandmother's journey starts in Birze and Schmielge, and this is my family going back to retrace that, those roots. My grandmother's born in September 18, 1915 in a village called Schmielge. She will grow up where most of the family was born and lived in Birze. For some reason, the family was in Schmielge when my grandmother was born. To give you a feel for what it was like then and what it was like when we visited in 2006, Schmilge is a very small rural town. About 550 people uh, lived there when we visited. It was a horse and buggy town when we visited. It was a horse and buggy town back before the war. You see no images of past Jewish life in Schmilge. You see many churches, but uh, no remembrance of the Jewish life that was there. Birze, on the other hand, was a, it was a much more thriving town. It's a northern town. The entire Jewish population of Birze is annihilated, except for survivors, of course, uh, by shootings that would happen, which was very well known uh, during the Nazi occupation, and, and I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, the town was completely burned down during the war, and it was rebuilt uh, when the Soviets took over. So here is my family's journey um, and my grandmother's first journey to Cuba. In the early 1900s, my, the oldest sibling, Tilly, and her grandparents would move to Ohio. Um, so that's our first entry into the United States. Most of the family in the early 1900s, uh, Leia's brothers, Shalom and Yaakov, will leave for Cuba. Um, to find better life there, business, they heard business was thriving there. And then the rest of the family would go join them in the late uh, 1920s and 1927. My great grandparents who are pictured on the left sitting along with uh, Leah, uh, her brother Herzl um, and her sister Bertha will all join the family in Cuba. 
The pictures with the stars are all pictures of my grandmother, Leah, with her sister, Bertha, who she'll be very close with um, throughout her life. My grandmother, for example, in the picture on the right, is standing on the left uh, with Bertha standing on the right. Um, in 1929, my great grandparents make the dreadful and fateful decision of returning back to Lithuania, not finding Cuba to be Jewish enough. My grandmother had the misfortune of being the youngest in the family, only being 14 at the time. The family made a decision that my grandmother should go back with my great grandparents so that they wouldn't be alone in Lithuania while the rest of them were either established or dating or at least were old enough to stay. Um, in Cuba. So my grandmother in tears will return um, to Lithuania where she will live in Birze, uh, which was the small town we talked about uh, before. The fascinating story, which I wanna share real quickly here is, uh, before we left, my grandmother told us the address where she lived in Birze. It was uh, 13 is the address, I forgot the street name. Um, and she told us a couple of things about the house if we were to find it. Um, that there would be a barn um, in the back of the um, house that had a roof that was tilted in and falling apart, a rowboat that would have a hole in it. And we were just laughing at her because the war <laughs> was so long ago. There'd be a road that led uh, behind the house to a cemetery that she would walk by um, to follow a stream. Um, so these were the details we had with the thanks of a tour guide, uh, which I'll show in a later picture and why they're so important for these journeys if families decide to take them. We believe we found my grandmother's house that she grew up in in Birze. It matched the street name and address. It had pictured on the right, the barn that was tilted over with the falling apart roof was still standing. There's a rowboat in the backyard with a hole in it uh, and a walkway to a cemetery with a stream exactly as my grandmother remembered it. On the back door, of the house, there was a mezuzah, uh, which is a Jewish uh, fixture for those um, who don't know, for religious purposes, we put them uh, uh, in the rooms of our home. Uh, the remembrance or the, the, um, the backing of the mezuzah was still on the stain of the mezuzah was still on the door, the mezuzah wasn't there. Um, the people in the house we got to meet, we didn't go in, but they were uh, very happy to, let us walk around and take a look. We get back home to Flushing, New York, where my grandmother is. We show her these pictures. She looks at it, she shakes her head and says, that's not my house. And we said, why grandma? And she said, because my house wasn't painted yellow. Uh, so uh, there you go for um, maybe it got repainted. Um, what happened to Lithuania during the war real quick so people to appreciate history on how dramatic people that survived um, Lithuania, how lucky they really were. There were three stages of the Holocaust in Lithuania, mass killings from June to December 1941. About 80% of the Lithuanian Jews were killed before 1942. There was a period where um, the, they put um, Jewish prisoners um, in ghettos. Um, for those that are very familiar with um, the history of the Holocaust, there are ghettos throughout um, Europe. Uh, some of those were in Lithuania. And then in April 1943 to July 1944 is the final liquidation um, of the Jews um, and other prisoners of war um, that were being held in Lithuania. About 90 to 95 percent of the Jewish Lithuanian people uh, were murdered during the war. The, um, this is a list from Yad Vashem, just shows you how important research can be and how you really can piece this all together of the various mass shootings that happened across Lithuania. The bar on the top in right um, is the um, mass grave uh, area where my great grandparents were shot um, and killed. And what normally would happen in these uh, killings are they would march the Jews um, and again, other prisoners um, out, uh, but mostly Jews to these mass grave sites where the Jews were then uh, dig their own um, um, holes that they would then be placed in and shot. Um, and so my great grandparents are in this area um, where they were uh, shot and killed. This is the area and the, the bar I showed you in right. This is the place we visited. 
Um, you, you can see a memorial on the right hand side that says Holocaust mass gravesite. The picture that you see in the lower left is my family along with this tour guide uh, who's pointing out with the glass sunglasses on, Ulick Dervich. Um, and the gentleman with his arms folded uh, is the known sole survivor that was still living in Birze. He was from Birze, stayed and lived in Birze. Um, and it was fascinating to meet him because he was able to take us around. He was so happy to meet us, of course. Uh, my grandmother got to speak to him on the phone when we were there. He was a little boy. My grandmother was older at the time, so they didn't know each other. But you could just hear in their voice the thrill of meeting each other. Um, and it was great to have him on the, the tour. So my grandmother's third journey, we have her journey to Cuba, her journey back to Lithuania. Well, her third journey is to the Vilnius ghetto. This is a before photo of the ghetto, uh, uh, not the ghetto, sorry. This is the, the picture of Vilnius, the main center of town before the war. You could see it as a thriving business and community. Um, this is a picture during the war, and I'll get into a moment. There were two ghettos in uh, Vilnius, but you can see, if you look on the sort of the right-hand side where those people are standing, that's like the entryway um, into the ghetto. And um, there were two ghettos. There was a small ghetto and a large ghetto. The small ghetto uh, was um, the Nazis determined were Jews that were incapable of work, uh, either because they were sick, they were old, um, they would be placed uh, in there just to be killed. Um, by the end of 1941, 40,000 Jews in the small ghetto were killed uh, in Ponary that were put into the smaller ghetto. The Jewish, the larger ghetto, um, which is the one more people are familiar with with ghettos, were where the Jews lived, uh, forced to work in factories like my grandmother, construction projects, labor camps, until they also were massacred um, in Ponary. At the end of the war, only about 2,000 to 3,000 Lithuanian Jews were liberated from the camps, plus you know, about 1,500 to 2,000 others that escaped at some point during the war. Quick story about my grandmother um, uh, and one of those names, which I'll get to in a minute, that you saw on the front page, Shapiro. She told us that um, there was an officer, uh, a Jewish officer uh, in the camp. Uh, each of these camps, the Nazis would have Jewish officers help enforce the, the laws, um, helped move her from the line on the smaller ghetto uh, to the larger ghetto. Um, they were dating, according to my grandmother at the time, um, and thanks to him, again, his name was Shapiro, um, he helped save her life, uh, which she'd be saved many times. To get a feel, when we were in Lithuania and Vilnius visiting um, the ghetto, this is the same street. Um, now you can see it's back and thriving and open. Again, the 18 on the right-hand side, there's a little plaque um, uh, memorializing that this was the entryway uh, to the ghetto. So just to get a feel. My grandma's fourth journey, and, and, and I'll tell you the quick story of both of these. My grandmother's name is Leah. My grandfather's name is Hirsch. Um, here is their quick chain of events of how they survive. And, and so you get a feel for why I have so much information about my grandmother, but not my grandfather. One, my grandfather is going to die in Cuba, so I don't have the same trace of memory that I have with my grandmother. Uh, but also, they didn't talk about it a lot with my father, and that was very typical in that generation. We just don't have as much about my grandfather, but with the help of records, this is what we do have. My grandmother was not in Birze. She was in Vilnius to live in the ghetto. Um, she was studying nursing at the time that she was rounded up in Vilnius. She will live in the ghetto for two years, from September 1941 to 1943. At that point, according to my grandmother, she was uh, transported to a, um, a labor camp uh, called Strasov. Um, that doesn't seem consistent with history, but my grandmother's never wrong, and it's always possible. Um, but that one's a little bit mysterious because Strasov's near Vienna. And most of the Jews in uh, Lithuania who survived and were transported to other camps were moved north in the Latvian uh, countries where my grandmother ultimately will go. She will be in Stutthof in August 1944, and she will ultimately survive on a German uh, landing craft. And I'll get to that in a minute because it's a 
fascinating survival. Not too many Jews survived this way and not too many people know that story. My grandfather is from Belarus. He's born in Kaunas. That was the, one of the towns I had boxed on the, the map. The way my grandparents know each other is my grandfather was an electrician at my grandmother's school um, in Birze. So he's gonna recognize the name. But my grandfather actually had a family before he will marry my grandmother that my grandmother kept secret from us. Either she was embarrassed or didn't want us to know. But my grandfather was actually married uh, before the war to a woman named Rivka. Uh, he will have one daughter, Shulamit. They are both murdered during the war. My grandfather, though, will survive in the Dachau concentration camp. His prisoner number is 82660. He's liberated in the Kalfering subcamp. How I know all this is here are some records we were able to find um, thanks to research, uh, uh, the Holocaust Museums, genealogy research. Um, the, these organizations are just terrific. Um, so my grandfather, Hirsch Yerakimovitz, born in 1907, you could see it all here. There's his prisoner number. He's liberated in Kalfering. The one that's real fascinating is my grandmother. This is uh, the card of her prisoner camp uh, uh, in Stutthof. Um, it was the International Tracking Service of the United States Holocaust Museum located the prisoner card. Look at my grandmother's name on the left-hand side, Leah Shapiro. Uh, Krawick, which is Kravitz, spelled many different ways. Um, um, the reason why that's so fascinating is my family has no record or never knew that my grandmother was married to someone named Shapiro, and, and it's possible she never was. Uh, but these records, and, and the Germans usually kept very good records, have her list that is married to a Shapiro. We believe the grandmother would never admit it, but they were, she claimed they were only dating, but we believe that she was possibly married to the Jewish officer that she mentioned in the Vilnius uh, camp that saved her life. That is his name. We've never been able to trace his route. There's many Shapiros and you know, always the mystery and history continues. So that was mystery number one. He once told my mother in confidence uh, many years ago, that um, her one true love, not my grandfather, but her one true love was a man that she met in the Vilnius um, camps. Um, we know that to be Shapiro. So there's always that lingering question, what kind of life and what was all that about? The other mystery is look at the birth date on the prisoner card. It's 1919. My grandmother was born in 1915. How could have this happened? Well, my grandmother had heard stories that when you got to camps, if you were a certain age, usually around the age of 29, the Germans would find the women too old um, and that um, you would be sent to death. My grandmother, with the help of just smart thinking, convinced and changed her birth date to 1919 so that she would appear four years younger than she really were, was. That helped her in many of the camps that she ultimately um, would go to. Um, so this is her prisoner card, and it's really fascinating. My grandmother ultimately survives on a liber uh, liberated um, on a boat. There's a famous book by a gentleman named Robert Watson called The Nazi Titanic. There are many women who survived this way. I mean, not many, but of the Lithuanian women that survived, some would survive by these boats. And what was happening at the end of the war, for those that know, the Germans were starting to retreat in back to Germany um, as the Soviets were invading them from one side, the United States and England uh, were invading them from the other side. So they started retreating and covering their evidence of the camps um, that they had. So many of the camps they would burn, many of the prisoners that they would take by foot out of the camps to retreat back to the center um, of Germany. And some, the northern part of and in the Latvian countries, they would take by boat um, using old uh, German fleet. They would evacuate the Jewish inmates from the Stutthof camp and other camps along the Baltic Sea. There are three ships that they mainly did this on uh, called the Cap Arcona, the Fieldbeck, and the Athen. Um, what happened and what was fascinating is the British not knowing, obviously, that these boats were really for Jewish prisoners to be marooned on. Um, they attacked um, the boats, bombed them because there were still Nazi soldiers on them. Those Nazis would leave the boats stranded 
um, to get bombed. Uh, by the time the British learned of this, of course, the damage had already been done. Nearly 10,000 um, out of the nearly 10,000 prisoners on the boat, more than 7,000 of them die. We believe that my grandmother was on the boat Athen. Uh, we don't have a record of it, but we believe it because it's this ship that was still docked and not capsized uh, over in the, in the ocean um, or in the sea. Uh, my grandmother was found on the bottom level of the boat. Um, she was wounded. She was transported to a hospital um, in, uh, and ultimately uh, liberated in a town called Eckenfort. I'll get to that in a minute. The records of the, these incidents are sealed by the British until 2045. That is not unusual. Many governments seal historical things like this uh, so that the generation that uh, lived through it would no longer be alive when it would be unsealed. Um, this is all talked about in, in this book, which I highly recommend for those interested on the rare survival, uh, one of the ways um, of survival of Holocaust survivors. My grandmother's fifth journey is in a town called Eckenfort. She will be displaced there. It's, um, I call it now sort of the Cape Cod of Germany. Um, it's a port on the north uh, eastern side of Germany. Um, you could see a picture on the bottom where my family vacationed on my dad's 60th birthday. Very quick story, because I don't want to run out of time and leave stuff for questions, uh, is um, we're sitting on one of these um, chairs on the beach, and, it was, and we did this awesome trip to Lithuania. We found all these records. I kind of look at my dad and go, this is where you're from. You were born in Eckenfort. We should keep going. Um, and he's like, nah, you know, this is my birthday. We really hit the jackpot, let's stop. And I encouraged him to keep going and we did. We go to the, the city office, uh, it was like on momentarily closing. We quickly tell them the story, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon. And you know, in that very thick German accent, they were like, sit down, um, we will help you. Uh, and they come out with this book where we find my grand, my father's remainder of his birth certificate where it was explained to us that my grandmother gave birth to my dad in a farm. Um, women, Jewish women still weren't allowed to give birth in hospitals. Um, they told us the address of the farm. We raced out there. The farm now is a place where they do wedding receptions. The woman was having a, a wedding reception that day. We drove up. We explained to her the story. She bursted into tears. Her parents used to run the farm and own the farm, and she was a little girl at the time that my grandmother gave birth to my father in this farm, she let us in. She told us all about the farm, the barn where my dad was born in, the house that my grandmother healed um, after giving birth to my dad. Um, and this is the apartment that she ultimately will live with my um, uh, father and my grandfather. Quick story, uh, which I forgot to piece it together for you. How does my grandfather and grandmother meet each other? They meet each other in Eckenfort. My grandfather, who survives in, um, in Dachau, returns to Bierze uh, because many of the smaller towns were putting up lists of survivors. Um, he saw my grandmother's name, recognized it, must have figured that his family perished in the war, um, went to Eckenfort to find her. Um, uh, they will get married in Eckenfort and have uh, my dad. My grandmother's sixth journey back to Cuba. My family, who I told you all about earlier, including Bertha, will learn that my grandmother survives the war. She marries, it's a second marriage, and I have a whole story I can tell people interested another time, but she will marry a man named Victor, who's from Riga. Um, and Victor came from some money, um, so he will help bring my grandmother to Cuba with my grandfather and my dad. Um, they leave for uh, German. They left Germany for France when my dad was six weeks old. He will sail. Uh, uh, sorry for the phone ringing in the back. He will sail to Cuba via France on 12446 on a ship called the Ile de France uh, when my dad was four months old. Um, they will arrive in New York. And they will then go to Cuba where in, in December 1946 and live in a town called Matanzas, Cuba. 
that is where my family is from. He will live with uh, my, his, she, sorry, she will live, Grandma Leah will live with her sister Bertha, uh, husband Victor, their son Stuart, um, and they will become very close. My father and his cousin, my cousin Stuart, are very close to this day. Primos, they call each other me primo, um, and, they've, and uh, you will see them in a minute. Here is the uh, ship manifest of the Ile de France. We'll blow it up for you. Um, oh, hey, uh, hold on. I want you to see it. There we go. So you can see my grandparents' names, Hirsch, Leah, uh, my uh, father, Sioma. It's actually spelled S-O-M-A on this ship manifest. Um, he will change his name when he gets to Cuba to Siomi uh, because an A is feminine uh, in Cuba, in the Spanish speaking countries. So my grandmother didn't want him to be thought of as a girl. Uh, so he will become so Siomi. Uh, when he comes to the United States, uh, his name will be Steve. Um, you can see my grandmother's profession is a nurse. My grandfather is a mechanic. And you can see that now my grandmother's birth day is correct. She's now 31 um, years old. And if you do the math, that would have brought her back to 1915 when she was actually born. Here are some pictures of my uh, family in Cuba. Uh, that is my grandmother and grandfather in the upper right. Uh, also below them are, you know, my father growing up um, and my uh, grandparents. The person I mentioned, Stuart, where they would play and live together in Cuba. Um, that is Stuart and my dad uh, living in Cuba and just living life. My uh, Stuart returns to Cuba and, and my dad returns to Cuba often. Um, there they are on the lower left, standing in front of their elementary school um, that they went to uh, together as um, kids. My grandma's seventh journey, she will flee Cuba to go to New York. Um, when the Castro comes to power in 1961, my grandmother is fearful that this is another Hitler um, and uh, Nazi occupation. Um, so she wants my father out of there. The year prior, Bertha, Victor, and Stuart will go to New York. So my grandmother and grandfather's plan was to send my dad there to live with them until they can get out of Cuba. Uh, my dad lives uh, leaves in May 1961 after the Cuban Revolution. They heard stories about teens getting brought into the forest to be indoctrinated into communism. So they get my dad out of there before any of that happens. My grandparents were supposed to join him in 1962. My grandfather, Hirsch, will pass away in, uh, during Passover 1962. Uh, my grandmother, Leah, convinces the Cuba government to let her go to the United States she will give up all of her possessions, her business. They uh, worked at factories um, and I think ultimately owned them, a shoe and box factory. Um, so now yet again, Germany, Lithuania, now Cuba, she gives up all of her belongings and will start life again at the age of 47 in Flushing, New York, again, living with her sister Bertha and starting all over again. She will ultimately become an accountant, a bookkeeper, at various places, uh, finishing her career at Queens College. She will meet the man on the right in the picture below. That is who I know of as my grandfather, Papa Max. Um, they met uh, when uh, my grandmother worked at the, the Carnation Seafood as a bookkeeper. They will get married in 1970 and live together um, in Flushing, New York for 35 years. Uh, that is the picture of their apartment. I am sitting with my oldest uh, daughter, Kaylee, on my lap with my grandparents and my dad. On the picture above that, that is the tombstone of my true grandfather, Hirsch Jerichimowitz, who I am named after, if you haven't been able to figure out yet, Howard and Hirsch. My Hebrew name is my grandfather's Hebrew name, Hirsch Alertzvi. Um, and I have not yet been to Cuba, but my father goes to make sure the tombstone stays intact. A little money to the caretaker goes a long way. And my dad and I, for my grandfather's 60th anniversary of his death, are planning on going to Cuba next year together so I can do my final journey of seeing my family.
my grandma's final journey uh, is in uh, 2012, 2013. Quick history. In 2007, my grandmother and my Papa Max will move to assisted living. Max will die two years later in 2009. So my uh, grandmother lives another four years now without uh, my grandfather uh, or my Papa Max. My grandma dies in July 2013, just two months before her 98th birthday. She had always told us she wanted to be the longest surviving of her siblings. The oldest sibling that she knew of was 97 years old uh, before um, that sibling passed. Um, so I think once my uh, grandmother turned 97, um, she might have been ready to cash it in. Or maybe the, the other sibling was 96, because uh, in her mind, she became the oldest. Uh, she will be born just a few weeks, three weeks. She will die, I'm sorry, just three weeks before the birth of my son, my her great-grandson, um, Alex, who's the third of my children. Um, holding, She is holding in her lap one of her other great-grandchildren, my brother's child, one of his three children, in February 2013. Um, and the most poignant picture of them all, of my grandmother and the many that I showed, uh, is um, right here in her final Passover Seder at my dad's um, house. Um, it, it's just amazing to me at, at 97 or 96 years old, that her face just looking at the Haggadah, um, it, it's one of the memorable pictures of her. Um, on the lower right at the Illinois Holocaust Museum, there's a walkway stones to memorialize um, uh, people from the Holocaust um, that are tombstones that my dad and I placed there so that she will always be part of me here in Illinois uh, and my grandfather, uh, both of them brave uh, survivors that we will never forget. Last thing I wanna say before I open it up uh, for questions, um, and I'm, I'm really happy to answer anything about of my family, um, the journey continues and why I really, why I give this presentation is I really want to urge others to, to continue their journey. No matter how much you think you have found out about your family, there's always more. And if you haven't started and are really interested in doing it, um, you can do it. Um, there are so many resources out there to help you. So our journey continues. We found that the Yad Vashem Central Database an entry from a woman uh, named Bella Chesnos Kazman, who we believe uh, to be a part of uh, Rivka's family. Uh, Rivka, if you remember, is, um, is uh, my grandfather's first wife uh, who perished in the war. You could see that based on that family's history, they believe that all three of them, Rivka, Gregor Tzvi, and Shula Meets, uh, uh, will perish in the war. Um, that is not true. Gregor Tzvi is my grandfather Hirsch. Um, Tzvi is his real Hebrew name. So uh, we know uh, not too many Jerichimowitzes out there that this is them and it matches the records that we have. We believe that my grandfather's side of the family um, had family that survived and moved to South America. And we are still in in search for that family. Uh, we would love to find them. Uh, it's just part of our, even though, you know, really only a half side of the family through my dad. Uh, my dad plates, places this ad um, in a newspaper in Uruguay. We have not yet made that connection. But the point I wanted to make is everyone's journey continues. You can make your journey um, and discover your family. Um, and it's been an, a humbling experience to take my journey with my family um, to, to see my grandmother and my grandfather's story. Um, and I'm humbled to have shared it with all of you. So I now open it up to questions and thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Great. Um, the first one is, um, in, what was it like for you to kind of go back and retrace your family's um, history that way? So it's pretty moving. Um, you know, as I said, that most families and my father um, is not unique. Uh, many of that generation don't really know their family history. 
because the survivors often didn't want to share that that story with their children, share the horror of it. Um, so it came, it was pretty hidden uh, to most children of that generation. Um, and uh, my my father's not on this call today, but I did this a month ago where he was, and um, I really do it for him also to share that story and take the journey uh, with him because I don't think he'd ever stand up and share this story. And I just think it's important and it's an honor for the third generation um, to do it uh, for their parents and their grandparents. So it really was just an eye-opening, amazing uh, trip to do with my brother and my dad and my stepmom. And we just learned so much. Amazing. Um, you mentioned you're planning to go to Cuba. Um, what are you hoping to find there? And do you have any plans to return to Lithuania? Uh, so my father and my cousin Stuart um, had to go to Cuba a lot. Uh, my, I could do a whole nother presentation on that side of the family. Um, so Stuart is a, a, an artist by trade um, uh, and ultimately has an amazing career in the United States. But through that, he, um, he takes trips to Cuba and takes people back with him. So for religious and art trips, uh, my father would go um, and they've been there many times. Uh, I, the purpose of my trip is to really go and see where my father grew up, uh, to go to the cemetery, uh, to see my grandfather's tombstone and who I'm named after. My grand, my, it's interesting, my father doesn't have many memories of his life in Cuba uh, before the United States. Some of them get shaken out from time to time, uh, but it's really my cousin Stuart who has these memories um, and has been able to open up my father is speaking about him. So I wanna go back and see it because my father, I think only is able to remember it well when he's there, <laughs> as opposed to trying to recall some of this stuff. So I'm really looking forward to it. That would be an amazing trip. Oh, and sorry, the second question, Lithuania. It is my family's goal to continue that journey um, and take my children someday. Um, we wanna pass on this story forever. Um, and going there is the best way to do it. So we hope to do that trip again. Um, hopefully my father will be able to do it, but if not, I will continue that history uh, for my family. Amazing. Um, let's see, the next question. Uh, did your mother ever give any video testimony, testimony to the Steven Spielberg project? So my, my grandmother, um, <clears throat> so it, interest, no, the, the short answer is no. Um, and I do want to make a comment about that. I had always tried while my grandmother was alive to get people to interview her. And I never had much success. And, and, and I'm not angry at anyone for that, but it, it always seemed odd that, because the Lithuanian story is an untold one. Um, and I never really got people interested um, in doing it because they were either busy or my grandmother maybe didn't take enough initiative or maybe I didn't take enough initiative. So we never were able to do those kind of things where I have her testimony tape. I have tape recorded it. Um, it came out pretty garbled. So thank God I was also a journalist in school. So I ferociously took notes um, and I have them in books. And, and you know, I told my kids, I'm writing a book about all of this, uh, which is going very slowly. So my uh, children have sworn to me that um, if I don't finish it in my lifetime, they will carry the mantle. So hopefully they can read my handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to seeing the book. Um, this next one is, um, is there any link to some of the many resources you use to track their history? Um, it seems a bit overwhelming to begin the process. So it is a little overwhelming. And I really have to thank my dad. Uh, he is the architect of all of this um, and the force that has made all of this happen. Um, but if you contact any of these agencies, the, any of the Holocaust museums will help point you in the right direction. Um, they have resources um, that can help you. Yad Vashem has a resource. And the one thing I recommend is if you're interested in going back to your respective homeland, um, we contacted all of these agencies before we went there through a tour, through the tour guide ULIC or on our own. So when we got there, it was all ready for us. That family tree that I showed you, they had worked on that before we had ever got there. They were interested in helping us. Everyone wants to help you. They're really interested in all of this stuff. So it's a phone call um, and there are there are resources out there. You, you are more than welcome to contact me anytime. Um, 
um, and I'm more than happy to share with you kind of what we did to get started. Um, let's see, next question is, um, how much of your grandmother's story did you know prior to your trip versus what kind of details were filled in? What were some of the new and interesting things that kind of were added to it? Yeah, good question. So my grandmother, and I don't think this is unusual, um, she would tell the story the way she wanted to tell the story. So what did she leave out? That she was probably married before, um, that my grandfather was probably married before. The way she told it as a kid was they were married and that they were the luckiest people in the world because both my grandfather and grandmother both survived the Holocaust and then refound each other. So as a kid, I was like, wow, that fairy tale story sounds awesome. But as I started, as I got an older in my head, I started questioning, how is that possible? My grandfather's so much older than my grandmother. Seven, he's, you know, he was born in 1908. It just seemed unlikely to me that that was the story. So part of this trip helped flesh out what we were suspicious about. And my grandmother, as she got older, started, I think, revealing some tidbits that led us uh, to the, the right thing. The other thing that this did was, whether I learned it or not on the trip, when I started putting this together, I'd get little tidbits from other members of the family. So my mother, once she heard I was doing this, and my mother and dad are divorced, so they, you know, she didn't really know what we were doing. But as, a, as she's seen this presentation and as she remembered the story of my grandmother telling to her her true love in life was, you know, um, this guy Shapiro in the camp. So other family members started remembering things thanks to my trip and things just started opening up and making more sense. Um, <clears throat> what was it or what kind of makes you want to share their story? Why is it important? Yeah, so I'm going to answer this in sort of, uh, I guess, two ways. I think it's important for all families generally to retrace their roots. And it's not just Jewish families. I, I tell this story to my non-Jewish friends and colleagues, and they all have fascinating stories. Um, so it's not just for Holocaust survivors to remember. Um, but I feel it's an honor uh, to continue to tell those stories. The first generation's dying out. Uh, the second generation has carried the mantle of telling the story, but not all of them can do it. Um, and I, it's an honor for the grandchildren and the third generation, not only to remember and pass it on because these generations aren't gonna last forever, but for us to pay it forward and tell the story um, uh, beyond. Um, these are all heroes and heroines, those who perished and those uh, who survived, uh, and they deserve their rightful place in history so that we remember them honorably. Um, it looks like I've got one more question. Uh, is there a Jewish community in Matanzas that carries the memories of these origins? That is another great question, and I'm looking forward to finding out the true answer when I go there. My understanding is that sort of Jewish life in in Cuba, the way my grandparents had it doesn't exist anymore. There is Jewish life there. And on these tours that my uh, cousin and my dad go on, they go to all these Jewish things that are in Cuba and it's very well orchestrated. I'm looking for the raw experience uh, and going back to the community where my dad was from and really seeing what is there. And my understanding is unless it's specifically orchestrated uh, for you, there's not much Jewish life or memory like it was back in the day. And that's part of the whole Castro and commun. I mean, they suppressed religion generally. Um, so you're not going to find much remnants of it. Um, I did want to go back one more thing on my trip to Lithuania. The other thing that obviously I learned and was so moving was seeing the things my grandmother talked about. I mean, seeing her house. Um, and, you know, I tell that story because it's so funny how it wasn't her house because it was painted yellow, but it, I know it was her house. So seeing her house and seeing the apartment my grandmother raised my dad, seeing the farm that my dad was uh, born in, th there's no other experience like that. Seeing the ghetto where my grandmother survived. You could tell me stories all day long and they're meaningful, but going there and seeing it, that's what I learned. Like it was 
it was so overwhelming. And I know it's going to happen in Cuba when we get there because my dad did it in Lithuania and he did it when he first went to Cuba. When we went to my grandparents' mass, my great grandparents' mass grave, so my dad's parents, grandparents' mass grave where they're shot, he kind of just huddled over it and he must have cried, I think, for about 15 minutes. And my stepmom tells me the same story when he visited my father, my grandfather's tombstone in Cuba is like a half hour where he is just crying uncontrollably. And my father doesn't do that. Um, so it's just so moving um, to see those things and be with my dad as he experiences it. Um, one quick thing, my gr father does not know that my grandfather died in Cuba um, when he goes to New York because my grandmother is so afraid of Castro she's worried that he's going to return for the funeral and never get out of Cuba again. Um, so my father does not learn that my grandfather dies uh, until after. Um, and that's why it's so moving. And it was so moving for him to return. Wow. Um, I look forward to hearing how that trip is. And you'll have to come back and I'm share, happy to share the it. other half of the story. Yeah. Um, that is all the questions I'm seeing right now. So I will let you say goodbye to everybody. OK, well, I want to thank everyone. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Uh, join us here next Wednesday, May 19th at 10 a.m. Central Time to hear Flory uh, Saget, the daughter of Holocaust survivors, share her family story. Please keep an eye on Illinois Holocaust Museum's Facebook and other social media accounts where we will post a stream of content through the weeks ahead. Thank you for your support during these extraordinary times. Um, thank you, everybody.